If you are like I am and you ever have to do some filing, do you ever find yourself humming the alphabet? You know, C, D, F, G, H, J, I, K, so that you can file in the correct place? I did that. Or sometimes one of those uh, institutions, if you're talking with your bank, tell me the last four numbers of your social security number. Well, I have to run through the whole thing right, before I can get to those last. Are you like that? All right, now, I'm going to talk and I'm going to ask you a question about the Apostles' Creed. So if you need to look at the whole thing, as opposed to going, I have got to follow my in order to get down to the point, you might want to turn to the back of your hymnal. It's at number 881. Now, if you were in Bible study on Wednesday, please do not give away the answer. My Bible study on Wednesday is so helpful. They are wonderful because they really help to shape what it is I'm going to preach on Sunday. We always, or normally, we look at the scriptures that I'm going to preach on in the coming Sunday. So I'm always grateful to them, but sometimes they know a few things ahead of time, so don't tell anybody. Now, if you're either running through the Apostles' Creed in your mind right now, or if you're looking at it at number 881 in the hymnal, what would you vote, there are no wrong answers here, but what would you vote as the most puzzling head-scratcher part of the whole creed? What would you say? You got it right first service, no cheating. That's exactly right. That was the number one answer in Bible study too. The Holy Catholic Church. Anybody else think that? Who thinks that's the most puzzling part of the whole? Okay, if you don't think that's the most puzzling part of the Apostles' Creed, what do you think he is? You remember the Apostles' Creed? We said it at the beginning of the service. <laughs> what do you think is the most puzzling part? What's missing? Ah, there's a whole lot missing. And the Holy Catholic Church is tucked into one of the areas where there's a whole lot missing. Now, you will remember that during the season of Lent, we are going to study the Apostles' Creed. And last week, we looked at, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And it's interesting that there's God, the Almighty, and he gets one sentence. That's it. Now, if you're still looking at the creed, you can tell which the creed thought was the most important part because that next section, there's a whole paragraph about Jesus, isn't there? There's a whole summation of the life. I believe in Jesus Christ our Lord. Birth, teaching, death, resurrection, and the judgment to come. Now, at this point, this is the second most puzzling part because we get to the end of the Jesus paragraph and it says he will return to judge both the quick and the dead. And if you have children who are beginning to pay attention to what's going on in church, they say, what does that mean? Quick, of course, is a very old English word that means alive. Have you ever seen the advertisement for Quicken Loans? <laughs> Okay, quicken loans would have you believe that they're going to do something fast. That's not what that means. <laughs> what they're talking about is they will bring a loan to life for you, but uh, they let you think whatever you want to so that if you want to get something done fast, maybe you'll call them. That ain't it. <laughs> Quick means a lie. But then we get to the third part of this Trinitarian section. I believe in the Holy Spirit. As somebody pointed out in first service, there is this whole bit back up in the Jesus part about conceived by the Holy Spirit. Other than that, that's it. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Nowhere where he comes from, nowhere where he's going, what he does. And instead, we have the rest of this section lumped together under Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So let me first of all suggest to you that when we talk about believing in the Holy Spirit, what we're doing is looking for signs of the Holy Spirit, and those are five of the signs. When the church is gathered, that's a sign of the Holy Spirit. When there is forgiveness of sins, that's a sign of the Holy Spirit. When the body gets resurrected, that is a sign of the Holy Spirit. So that we don't say anything about the Holy Spirit, 
We just missed some things where we know the Holy Spirit's at work. But especially if you've ever brought a visitor to church with you, you got to that point, right at, I believe in the Holy Spirit, yeah, the Holy Catholic Church, and if your friend was really alert, they may have leaned over to you and said, I thought it was Methodist when we came in. <laughs> Now, if you're still looking at the creed and the hymnal, you will note that the word Catholic is in a lowercase letter. It does not start with a capital letter. The Holy Catholic Church. That's because Catholic is one of those words that gets held over. It's an old word as well, but it means universal. When you and I deal with what we call our Catholic brothers and sisters, what we're really dealing with is the Roman Catholic denomination. And since that's the name, the proper name of something, it gets capitalized. We are not a Roman Catholic church, but we are part of the Catholic part of the universal church. And when we declare our belief in a universal church, that's one of the signs of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I ask the children the question, what is the church, or what does the church look like, or what's in the church, sometimes they describe the church house. But as you well know by now, the church is the people. Now, I do have some job descriptions. Where'd Nalene go? Did she? She disappeared on me. Well, that's too bad. She'd enjoy this. I found some church job descriptions. Lynn will enjoy this. I found some church job descriptions. Lynn, are you ready for this? Okay. Here's the job description for the pastor. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. More powerful than a locomotive. Faster than a speeding bullet. Walks on water. Gives counsel to God. Then there's a job description for an associate pastor. Some of you remember Brian Deeroff? Able to leap short buildings in a single bound. <laughs> as powerful as a switch engine. Just as fast as a speeding bullet. Walks on water when the sea is calm. Talks with God. The minister of music. You can tell Nolly and I really said this about her. Leaps short buildings with a running start. Almost as powerful as a switch engine. Faster than a speeding BB is occasionally addressed by God, walks on water if she knows where the stumps are. <laughs> and then there's the minister of youth. Sorry about this. Runs into small buildings. <laughs> Recognizes a locomotive two out of three times. Uses a squirt gun. Knows how to use the water fountain. Mumbles to himself. And then there's the church secretary. Lifts buildings to walk under them. Kicks locomotives off the track. Catches speeding bullets with her teeth. Freezes water with a single glance. When God speaks, she says, may I ask who's calling? <laughs> I have had it happen to me that when I was in the grocery store at some point, not in my robe. The children who are also there, children from the church who are shopping with their parents will look at me and you can see they're really working. I've seen that person before somewhere. <laughs> and I have had it happen on occasion when a child would point and say, Mommy, there's the church. <laughs> now anybody who's been a part of a church for any length of time knows perfectly well that the church is not limited to the pastor and the church is not limited even to the church secretary. It's interesting when we read John's understanding of what the church is going to be. John records what's called Jesus' high priestly prayer. And the prayer happens after the Last Supper and before Jesus' arrest. And that's what we heard Tom reading this morning. 
Now, friends, this is high, beautiful, ancient Greek. Now, if you ever took philosophy when you were in college, you might take philosophy when you were in college, you might take logic when you were in college. All of that is based in a Greek notion of how things work. And the Greek notion of how things work is like this. If this happens and this happens, then this happens. If, then. That's how Greek logic works. My younger nephew is on the, logic, or on the debate team. And it's fun to watch a debate team because here you see young minds working out the logic of an argument. If this, then this. They're all based in this same time period of Greeks developing what you and I now call the philosophy of logic. And the Gospel of John is written in that language. So while Tom's up there and you and I are struggling with the sentence structure, that's because ancient Greek and modern English don't always mix very well. In Greek, there's black and white. If this, then this. In English, we've expanded that a little bit. Well, sometimes if this happens, and if this happens in exactly the right way, then maybe this will happen. That's English all over. But not in the Greek of the Gospel of John. So listen particularly to the verses, um, let's see, 22 and 23. The glory that you have given me, this is Jesus speaking, I have given them, meaning the disciples, so that they may be one as you and I are one. In them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me. Now here's how that goes in Greek logic. If the church is one, then the world will know that Jesus has come from God. And that is a very uncomfortable logic sentence to think about. If the church is one, then the world will know that Jesus comes from God. And you and I look around and we worry and we wonder, why don't more people believe in Jesus? <clears throat> and maybe instead of looking out, why don't others, maybe we better start by looking inward. Because if we are not one, then can we hardly blame the world for not knowing? that Jesus comes from God. Some of you may remember the old worship wars. Remember the worship wars back in, oh, I think it was the late 80s into the early 90s? The worship wars were all about music. I can't worship unless there's a piano or an organ. Don't you let those guitars and drums in here. You remember those days? Uh -huh. And that was countered with the other side that said, that's old fashioned stuff. It's not speaking to the world as it is. Who needs an organ or a piano anymore? Let's sing something more contemporary. Now, the reality is the worship wars have sort of settled down, but we're not really at peace. We just sort of have a temporary treaty in place. And the temporary treaty goes like this. I like worshiping with an organ and piano and hymn. So I'm going to worship over here. I prefer worshiping with drums and a guitar and praise songs. So I'm going to worship over here. And the only peace between us is that we have agreed to leave each other alone. <laughs> and if we are not one, is it any wonder that the world does not know Jesus Christ has come from God? 
Of course, in our own Methodist history, there are more embarrassing chapters than that. Up until 1972, the United Methodist Church had a separate annual conference for our African American <coughs> brothers and sisters. That's after the Uniting Conference to bring together the Evangelical United Brethren Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church. If you push back further than that, of course, there was the Methodist Church South and the Methodist Church North. Because we had split about slavery and even the North and South churches agreed that we shouldn't all worship together and so our African-American brothers and sisters sat in the balcony. And we wonder why the world doesn't know that Jesus came from God when we ought to be saying, how is it that we need to be one? Also in the late 70s, there was a war about communion. It took place with the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches were an attempt to say, okay, can we agree on some things as being church? And things went along pretty well until they began to discuss communion because when they began to discuss communion, the church in the Pacific Islands said, it's expensive, it is prohibitively expensive to import anything that's been made from grapes, whether you're talking about grape juice or whether you're talking about wine. And we are going to use coconut milk for communion. And the Northern European contingent went up the wall. So we argue about what should we use for communion? And of course, further back than that, we argue about what happens to communion anyway. What happens to the bread and the wine? And we argue about how much water should we use for baptism? And what age should people be baptized? If you push back further than that, the reason we call them the Roman Catholic denomination is because the head of that denomination resides in Rome. And in 1054, his forefather in the faith went to Alexandria, Egypt. Was it Alexandria? And declared that the so-called Orthodox Church, what you and I would call the Greek Orthodox Church, was hereby excommunicated. And the Bishop of Rome walked up to the front of the church, smashed his staff, and walked out. And the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church still are separate. They are not one as Jesus prayed, and we wonder why the world doesn't know that Jesus is sent from God. Now, as you might imagine, I have a stake in this because there are some denominations that don't believe women should be pastors. So probably all of us somewhere along the line have the ground where we will not give. And that's probably a commentary on us, not a commentary on God. Certainly not a commentary on Jesus. Jesus prayed, Father, I pray that they may all be one so that the world will know that you have sent me. And we are still waiting for that prayer to be answered. My guess is that God is not just going to drop some miracle on our heads to answer that prayer. My guess is that God is going to work through us to answer that prayer. My guess is that God is going to work through us, and that means that we're going to have to look around. You don't have to start very far. My guess is there are some really peculiar people in your Sunday school class. <laughs> and you love them, 
But you think, how can you call yourself a Christian? There may be some people in your family who don't think you're a Christian. And that's a painful thing to have going on in a family, isn't it? So it may be that we're going to have to do some repair work in our own families. It may be that we're going to have to go to another church occasionally. I'm not asking any of you to leave. But to go visiting to another church occasionally, to say, we are the body of Christ together. And that when we find someone who does not have a church home, because we're not trying to poach, but to invite them to say, come with me, come with me to see the body of Christ in action. And you might start with a worship service. It's always a good place. But it might be you're going to invite them to food distribution. It might be that you're going It might be that you're going to invite them for a meal. I pray, O oh Father, that they may be one as you and I are one so that the world may know that you have sent me. And when we proclaim that we believe in the Holy Catholic, the Holy Universal Church, it's a call to action on our part to believe in the Holy Catholic Church, in the Holy Universal Church, is to be prepared to work to answer Jesus' prayer. That we may all be one even as Jesus and the Father are one, so that the world may know that God has sent Jesus. And I do. I believe in one holy, Catholic, universal church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.